Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19, and we'll read verses 19 through 21 in just a few moments. I can still remember it like it was yesterday. My first night at college. Now, I don't know, your experience in college might be different than mine. Uh, I went to a Bible college where everybody was training to be ministers. So our first night in college was probably a little different than perhaps yours was. Uh, We had this massive worship service. And so we go and next to our cafeteria at the school, there's this kind of outdoor amphitheater area where everybody's sitting up on this hill. And they start doing worship, and I'm like, man, this is, this is great. This is going to be good. And then one of my favorite speakers, who happens to be a professor at the college, gets up, and he starts giving this dynamic message. And I, I am just in heaven. I'm going, this is, like, this is like church camp every day for the rest of my life. This is going to be the best. I can't wait. This is phenomenal. And he comes time to decision time. And I start looking around, I'm like, what, what decisions are we going to make? Like, we're in Bible college. We're all training to be ministers. What is, what's, what's there to do? And so he starts going through this, and he goes, you know what we're going to do tonight? We're going to let every one of you start over. And we want you to go back to your rooms. And if you've brought anything to, to school that you shouldn't have brought with you, we want you to come. We're going to have a huge bonfire, and you're going to burn it. And I'm, I'm looking, and I'm like, okay, like, Who's bring, we're at Bible college. Like, what are you bringing to Bible college that's going to be something that's worthy of burning? And so, like, I'm really confused because my parents brought me to school, like, helped me pack up. They helped me, you know, do my whole room. So, like, I, there's no chance I could have brought something I shouldn't have brought to college. But I went back to my room because that's what they told us all to do. And so we go in, and I'm looking around. And I'm like, okay, is, like, someone going to own up and be like, hey, I brought, you know, whatever. I, what's this going to be? So, I, I had nothing to burn. And so I'm like, well, I'm just going to write on a sheet of paper something. And I don't remember what I wrote, but I wanted to have something to throw in the fire just in case I needed to do it. And so we go, and I'm just kind of sitting back. You know, I'm the freshman. I need to watch and see what everybody else is doing so that I'm not totally, you know, just out there. And, I mean, people are bringing stuff in. And there's people, remember, this is 2001, so people with, like, stacks of CDs that are of all this bad music that they're going to burn and throw in this thing. And there's people with magazines. There's people, there were some people with stuff that I was surprised they showed up to school with it. And they, they threw it in the fire and all this. And I will never forget this one kid. I don't know who he is. To this day, I, I couldn't tell you who he was. But he is sitting by the fire, and he's just contemplating for probably about 15, 20 minutes. And I'm sitting there. I'm just watching him like, what? I wonder what's going on in this guy's head. So eventually he pulls his wallet out, he takes a dollar bill, and he throws it in the fire. Okay. Don't know why you shouldn't have brought money to school, but uh, if that's what he feels like he needs to do, might as well. And so I'm like, that was kind of weird. Pulls out his wallet again, takes another dollar bill, throws it in the fire. And I'm like, am I missing something here? Like, why is this guy setting money on fire? This isn't what my dad told me you're supposed to do with money in his book when he wrote it. And I'm, I'm going through this whole thing. And like, really, I'm confused as to what, what he's doing. And so I'm, I'm just watching him. How much money is he going to burn? And I'm not kidding. For, for a while, like 20 different dollar bills. I don't know what denominations they all were. But, I mean, he's just going and throwing all of his money in this fire. And I'm starting to think, like, okay, I get, I get the metaphor of, hey, money was my idol. I want to... But dude, like, don't burn everything you've got. Like, there's got to be a, there's got to be a balance in here somewhere. And so eventually, one of the professors comes up and they real gently just put their arm around him and they're like, "Hey, I think God gets the point. Like, you, like you don't need to burn, you don't need to burn the rest of your money. You're still gonna have to pay for school, you know." <laughs> um, but I, I was just sitting there going, like, this is wild, that this guy's just throwing money over and over. And it doesn't make sense. The only way it makes sense is if he truly felt that God had called him to do something that was just over and beyond what anybody else would thought was reasonable. And hear me out. This is my disclaimer. I'm not encouraging any of you to go and burn all your money, okay? That's not a good idea. 
But in our story today, we find a man, Elisha, who when he was given the call, the opportunity to follow, he didn't leave anything behind. Or excuse me, he didn't leave anything to chance. He burnt all that he had to follow because the call was that great. So hopefully you're there. First Kings chapter 19. If you would, please stand for the reading of God's Word. We'll just read verses 19 through 21, and I'll read from the ESV. So he, that's Elijah, departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the 12. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, go back again, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him, took the yoke of the oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Mark Batterson in his book, All In, says, one of our primary spiritual problems is this. We want God to do something new while we keep doing the same old thing. My guess is there's some of us, if not all of us today, that we desire something new, something greater, something better from God. But on our end of the bargain, we're just doing the same old thing. And yet, Elisha, when he's given the opportunity to follow, he abandons everything. And so what I want to do this morning, I want to go through four spiritual truths that we can learn from this text, and hopefully it helps us to understand his story a little bit more, and more importantly, apply these truths to our life. Here's number one. God is still active even when he feels absent. God is still active even when he feels absent. We pick up the story where Elisha is just out in the field plowing. Like, that's it. There's no, like, hey, this is who Elisha is, and these are all the powerful things he's done. Here's who he's related to, all of that, none of that. It just picks up the story that this man is in his field plowing, just doing what he's supposed to do. Same thing over and over and over again. Just being faithful. And Elisha, just doing what he's supposed to be doing, has no idea that all the while Elijah is complaining to God. If you look back in your text, you can read in chapter 18, we're not going to go through it, but Elijah's greatest moment of his ministry just happened where he defeated the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. You remember that story where he calls down fire from heaven. It's this powerful moment. As soon as that happens, Elijah goes and hides in a cave. And he's depressed. He's distraught. He's disillusioned. Where he thinks that, that there's no one else doing what's right in Israel. No one's left. No one's able to do anything right except for me. And so he starts pleading with the Lord, and he says, God, I'm the only prophet that's left in all of Israel that hasn't bowed a knee to Baal or who hasn't kissed the idols. And you can look in the verse right before where we just started in 1 Kings 19, verse 18. Listen to how God responds to Elijah. He says, yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. You know what he's telling Elijah? I've got 7,000 people that are still doing what's right. And let me just give this to you as a, as a side note. Satan's lie is always that you're the only one, whether it's for good things or bad things. You, you commit some terrible sin, and Satan's going to come in, and he's going to go, you're the only one that's ever done this. You're the only one that's struggling. You can't tell anybody about your struggle. No one else is going to understand or, hey, you're living for God, you're doing it right, you're doing a great job, guess what, guess what Satan's going to tell you? Why are you doing this? You're the only one. You're the only one that, that, that's leading. You're the only one that's serving. You're the only one that's trying to live for God in your family. You're the only one that's doing these things. And Elijah buys into it. And here's Elisha, 
just doing what he's called to do. Nothing spectacular, nothing fantastic, nothing out of the ordinary. He's just plowing. And I don't know what, what you feel at times if you're like me, but there's some times when you just are doing what you're supposed to be doing that you just start to wonder, and you're like, God, do you, are you seeing this? Like, you know what's happening, and sometimes God can almost feel absent. And I've got to tell you, you're not forgotten. God knows what you're doing because God knows what he's doing. And God is still active even when he feels absent. You know, we went through a series a a few years back called The Story. Any of you remember that? Remember going through the story? Yeah. The, The story is this study through the Bible where it takes pretty much all the major stories from the Bible and makes them one big story. And the 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 whole premise of this series is that there's this upper story that God sees where it all works out together and it's just beautiful. And then there's this lower, lower story where you see people and they're like confused as to what God's doing. Uh, the two illustrations that fit well for me is like if someone was to give you a book, man, it's the greatest book you've ever read. You got you to check it out. But they only let you read one chapter. And you're going, well, how do, I don't know who these people are. I don't know how the story ends. I mean, this makes no sense. That's because you're only seeing part of the story. You're not seeing the whole thing. Or if someone gives you a puzzle, but you can only see one piece. This puzzle makes no sense with my piece, but guess what? When every piece is put together, it's this beautiful puzzle, right? And it's the same that's true with God's story with you. Sometimes we get all confused. We're going, God, what's happening here? But God's working something together that you and I can't fathom on our own. So pick up the text, verse 19. It says, Elijah departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Snapchat. I was hoping people would be reading their Bible with me because that's just funny to me. When you look at it, look at it. It, I mean, it looks like Snapchat. They're just missing one letter. I don't know if his name's Snap Fat, Snap Hat, what it is, but thank God he's not Snapchat Junior. He's Elisha, okay? And Elisha's family named him Elisha on purpose. His name means, my God is salvation. And as a father... I look at this and I go, his daddy knew. My son's made for more than this. And he knew that a day like this would come when Elisha would start to fulfill his true calling. My God is my salvation. Elisha's out there plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the 12. Now, that's an easy one just to look past. This is an important statement. The fact that he's plowing with 12 yoke of oxen means that this guy comes from a wealthy family. Uh, 12 yoke, this is representing 24 oxen, okay? A yoke binds two oxen together so that they can plow together. The other part that's significant about this is we don't know of any technology in those days where all 24 oxen would work together at one time. So what this means is there's probably 12 people out there. One working with these two, one working with these two, all of that. Elisha's all the way in the back, which would have actually been the lead position when you're plowing like this. He's the one that said everything. And even with everyone else around, God sees Elisha. Even when he seems absent, he's still active. Galatians 6, 9, Paul puts it this way. He says, let us not grow weary of doing good. Keep plowing. For in due season, we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. Listen, don't give up. Keep doing what you're doing. God sees it. God's still working. You keep showing up. And someday, it's going to come for you. God is still active even when he feels absent. Here's number two. Small actions can have a profound impact. If you read... Uh, Keep going in verse 19. It says, Elijah passed by him and just cast his cloak on him. This seems like nothing really special, right? Uh, Those of you that have the King James, you can see what this word actually means for the, he cast his cloak on him. It says that he cast his mantle on him. The same word as glory. What's happening here is Elijah's doing something small, but to Elisha, it has a profound impact. Elijah's just casting his cloak, but what Elisha's feeling 
is that the mantle of God that was once on Elijah is now on him. This is what he's been waiting for. This is his moment. This is, this is a powerful thing. It's the same terminology that's used in Genesis 41, verse 42, when it says that Pharaoh took his signet ring and put it on the finger of Joseph when he made him second in charge of all of the nation of Egypt. You know, you and I, we can't predict the impact that one word of encouragement can have on someone. I don't know how many times you've had someone come up to you and they go, man, I just got to tell you, that time that you, you encouraged me, that time that you sent me that note, that time you sent me that text, that time you, you showed up at the hospital with our entire Connect group when my family member was dying, you don't know what that means to me. It was just one small action for you. But it was something that had profound impact for someone else. Scott, Scott Adams puts it this way. He says, remember, there's no such thing as a small act of kindness. For every act creates a ripple with no logical end. Small actions have profound impact. Here's number three. We leave everything to follow Jesus. You look what happens in verse 20. It says that Elisha left the auction the oxen, and ran after Elijah and said, let me kiss my mother and father, and then I will follow you. And he said to them, you go back again, for what have I done for you? You hear Elijah again? He's like, I didn't do anything special. And Elisha's going, no, 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 no. I, I know I'm about to tell my parents bye. I do all, do all this. I, I, I'm willing to leave everything. Look at it in verse 20. He left the oxen and ran. It reminds me of the disciples when Jesus called them by the Sea of Galilee. You remember it in Luke chapter 5, verse 11, where Jesus says, come follow me, and it says, they left everything and followed him. Listen, when you and I come to Jesus, when we give our life to Christ, we leave everything. There's an old statement I heard a long time ago that has always stuck with me, and it's this that Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. It's the nature of it. That if Jesus is not the Lord of everything in your life, then he's really the Lord of nothing. There's, a, there's a, this idea. I thought it was original with C.S. Lewis, but when I did my research on it this week, it, it said that C.S. Lewis is mis, mis, uh, misquoted or whatever. He, he's given credit for something that he never said. So I don't know who originally said it. But there's this idea that inside of every human being is a heart, and in that heart is a single throne, just one chair that's there, and only one thing can be on that throne. So either Jesus is on the throne of your heart, the throne of your life, or you've put something else in there. He says you leave everything and follow him, and what we do is we go, well, you know, I really like this. We, we, we say all this other stuff. Let me, let me show you what Jesus says. If you remember back in August, my dad preached from Luke chapter 14. If you have your Bibles, turn there. Luke chapter 14, Jesus talks about the cost of discipleship. And starting in verse 25, this is what he says. He says, now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned aside and said to them, if anyone comes after me, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, when we read this verse, we go, wait a second. Did Jesus just tell everybody, like, you need to hate all your family? Like, you need to hate your mother and father? Teenagers love this verse. Um, no. <laughs> no, that's not what Jesus is saying. Remember, you got one throne. What he's saying is, I, I'm here. I'm on the th You can't put your father, you can't put your mother, you can't put your son, your daughter, your brothers, your sisters, you can't put anything there. Otherwise, when you do, you move Jesus to second place. There's one throne. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And if you make Jesus the Lord of your life, what he says goes. I'm, I'm following him no matter where, no matter when, no matter what. In Matthew's version of this passage, Matthew tells it a little bit differently. Instead of you must hate, he says you must love me more 
than your father, your mother, and all these things. You have to be willing. You want to follow Jesus. You really want to leave everything to follow him. You have to be willing, no matter what he asks you to give up, that I'm willing to give that up to follow him. He goes on in verse 27 of Luke chapter 14. He says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. And then he goes on to talk about a king going to war. I want you to go down to verse 33. It says, so therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. You hear what Jesus says? We leave everything to follow Jesus. Why? Because he left everything to come and get us. And there is nothing in this world that compares to knowing Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. And whatever he asks us to give up, it pales in comparison to what he promises to give us when we get to heaven. And so what we're called to do, just like Elisha, we leave everything to follow Jesus. Here's number four. You cannot fully grasp Jesus until you completely let go. You cannot fully grasp Jesus until you completely let go. You know, there's some people that have a really hard time understanding who Jesus is. I don't get why he asks this. I don't get why he does that. I don't understand all these things. Well, it's probably because you're still holding on. You're still holding on to some things that you, you haven't let go of just yet. And so you're not going to fully understand him. You're not going to fully grasp who Jesus is. You're not going to take hold of him because I'm holding on to too much other things. And so look what happens for Elisha Elisha in verse 21. It says, he returns from following him, took the yoke of oxen, and he sacrificed them. And then he boiled their flesh with the yokes of the ox, oxen. Literally, he takes the yokes, the wood that was holding these two together, and he starts a massive fire, burns the flesh of the oxen on top of it, gave it to the people, and they ate. No turning back. Stephen Furtick, in his book, Greater, says it this way. He says, your greater life doesn't begin with you building your dream house. It begins with you burning down your old house. You know, there's, there's people that, that don't understand their relationship with Jesus, and it's because we're still holding on to things. Or perhaps the better way to ask it is what's left to burn? In your life, what is it that you're still holding on to? What is it that you're still not letting go of? What is it that you still need to burn? Can I give you five areas that I think might help us figure this out? First area is our hidden struggles. You know, there's, there's people in the church that are like Achan. You remember the story from Joshua chapter 7? The Israelites had just made it into the promised land, and they, they went and they attacked their first walled city, this powerful city called Jericho. Walls came tumbling down, and what God asked of the Israelites, he said, since this is your first victory, I want all the spoils of war. You give them all to me because the first things belong to God, remember? And so everybody does it except for one man. Achan thinks, you know, God's not going to notice if I just help myself to a little bit of the silver. I mean, who's, who's going to know? So the Israelites go out and they went on the, their second conquest. They came to this smaller city called Ai. And you know what happens to them at Ai? They get defeated. And Joshua comes back and he looks to the Lord and he says, God, what happened? And God says, there's sin in your camp. There's someone who's hiding something. And so he goes and he says, who is it? What's going on? What's happening? And Achan finally comes forth and he says, I've been hiding this. What about Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts where they told the whole church, hey, we just sold a field and we're giving all the money to the church. Great. And so they come up, and it's time for offering, and, and hey, we're, we're bringing all the money. And the, the disciples, having some intuition, going, I don't think you guys are telling the truth. They go, so this is all the money from the field you? Oh, yes, this is all of it. We are giving everything to God. They're lying. 
And let me tell you, the, the, the problem was, there's not an expectation for all of us to give all of the money we get from selling a field to God. No, it was the fact that they lied about how much they were giving. And so they lie about it, and God strikes both of them dead right there in the church service. They're hiding it. Or what about what Jesus says to the scribes and the Pharisees? You remember in Matthew chapter 23, he gives all these woes to the Pharisees? And he tells them in verse 27, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So also you outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. There's some of us that think that you're getting away with hiding all these struggles. Ah, nobody knows that I'm still dealing with this. Nobody knows that I'm going through this. No. It's time to surrender. It's time to let go and give that to the Lord. Here's number two. Our sinful desires. In the New Testament, it doesn't talk so much about burning these things. The way that Paul talks about it in his letters is he talks about how we should put to death whatever belongs to our sinful nature, these sinful desires that we have. He puts it this way in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever is earthly in you. The NIV says, whatever belongs to your sinful nature, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. You know, the sad thing is, there's a lot of people who claim to follow Jesus, but if you were able to really look at their life, you would wonder if they love their sin more than they love their Savior. They just keep going back to that same thing over and over and over again. And Satan lies to us. And he makes us think that, that somehow this sinful desire, somehow giving in to sin over and over and over again is going to make us happy, is going to give us a sense of fulfillment. But you know it never does. And isn't it amazing that somehow we still hold on to these sinful desires rather than completing letting go and saying, God, help me completely get rid of this. Help me just fully surrender my life to you. There's some of us that need to let go of some sinful desires that we haven't let go of yet. Here's number three, past regret. There's some people that it's not the hidden struggles or the sinful desires that have them to where they fully aren't following Jesus, but really what it is, it's the past regret because of the two. And they're reminded over and over again how they're not worthy, how they've, how they've made these mistakes, and they're a terrible person, and no one is, is, is ever going to want them to do anything because they've done all these wrong things. Now, let me ask you a question. Who do you think is reminding you of your sin? You think that's God? You think that's the voice of the Holy Spirit inside of you reminding you of all the wrong things you've done? Absolutely not. That's our enemy who reminds you of all of your sin while the voice inside of you, the Holy Spirit, reminds you of Jesus and how he covered all of your sins. If you don't believe me, let me give you a couple verses. Hebrews 10 verse 17, then he adds, I will remember their sins and lawless deeds no more. Why do you keep remembering what God's already forgotten? Romans eleven twenty seven. 27, this will be my covenant with them, that I will take away their sins. Hebrews 8, verse 12, for I will be merciful towards their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. Micah 7, verse 19, he will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Listen, you need to let go of your past regret so you can fully grasp Jesus. Fourth area is dangerous addictions. These are things that aren't necessarily sinful, but they're also not good for you. It's just foolish. It's not wise. They're dangerous addictions that, that they're not sinful, but they, more often times than not, they lead to sinful things. The way the Hebrew writer talks about it in Hebrews 12, verse 1, he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us throw aside every weight, or let us lay aside every weight. 
He's talking about someone who's running a race. Imagine someone running a marathon and, man, let me just put all these weights on me. That makes no sense. You're not going to be able to run fast. You're not going to be able to run long when you're just weighting yourself down with all of this. You know that's the opposite of what Jesus tells you? We, we put on all these burdens, but Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. You know what that means? Carrying a lot of burdens. He says, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon, me, upon you and learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know what he's saying? There's a lot of people that have this false misunderstanding where they go, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to follow Jesus all by myself, and I'm going to conquer sin on my own, I'm going to do all these things. And you think that somehow it's an issue of willpower, that I'm just going to be able to do this all on my own. No, that's not how it works. Jesus says, I'm in this with you. We're yoked together. That my strength becomes your strength. My power becomes your power. And together we're able to do all of this. And when you're holding on to these dangerous addictions and you're saying, man, I got this all by myself. No, you don't. You need the power of Jesus to overcome it. So let go so you can grasp him and watch how Jesus can give you victory over it. The last one, and this isn't an exhaustive list. I know there's other things that hold us back. But the last one I want to talk about is former success. We almost celebrate this in our culture where we love to talk about how good we were in the good old days. And I, I have learned, the older that I've got, the better I became from when I was younger, right? You know, every man in the room, we were all the best football player and everything, yeah. At 5'8", you know, I, I sure was. Um, my, my, my football career ended as a cougar in the Arlington Optimist League when I was in sixth grade, so I can't, you know, talk about any of that. Anyways. But we love to, to, to talk about our former success. But you know what the biblical idea of this is? Paul talks about it in Philippians chapter 3, where all these people are boasting about what they've done and how great they are. He says, guys, you want to start looking at resumes? I can give you mine. And he goes through all these things about his former life. But you know what he says? He says, because of Christ, I count them all as rubbish. Verse 13 and 14, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward toward what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What's left to burn for you? What are you still holding on to that you haven't let go you know, there's a powerful story from 1519 when the great Spanish conquistador Hernan Cortes came to Veracruz and he was building this huge Spanish army that he was going to go and he was going to liberate Mexico from the Aztec Empire. And so he comes to shore and he starts training his army and he trains them all these things. But before they go to the Mexico City area to, 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 to attack the, the Aztecs, you know the last thing he tells his men to do? He says, go burn the ships. And the whole army's looking at him like, what? That's our ticket home. I know. Burn the ships. And so they go. They dismantle all the ships and they set them on fire. And guess what happened? They went to the Aztecs, and they defeated him. So I guess my final question for you today is the same question I've asked multiple times. What's left to burn? Let's pray.